whole idea of social justice in the book of James, that phrase can be sometimes controversial in Christian circles. Can you talk about social justice in this book alongside of the gospel? I mean, why do we need to be about the poor? I, I think it goes back the same way it did in Deuteronomy, since we were just talking about that, which is that if God has chosen the poor of this world or has God has taken people out of slavery, yes. you know, it, it's this level of that's our identity. That's yes. who we are. So we, the God has chosen us who are the poor of this world. And so for us to then oppress the poor, it's, it doesn't make sense. And it's, it's an identity issue, mm. you know, essentially. Wow. You know, social justice has gotten a bad rap, but mm. I mean, to me, it's... It's beautiful and necessary, and um, matter of fact, the first year that I started on this study, um, I went with Compassion International to Calcutta, India, uh, and it was funny yes. because that right. when, when Sean Groves called me to go on that trip, I did not want to go. I had too much to do, just gotten married, and, um, and I felt that the Lord said in my spirit, no, this is what we're going to do, mm -hmm. because if you're going to write on James, we're going to go see the poor. I am so glad you came back to Bible study this week, especially after we only studied one verse in the last session. And for you that may have missed that, you may be glad because an hour is a long time to spend on one little verse. We're going to do a little bit better today. Now, let me tell you what we've had behind us in this week of homework. We're really getting into it now. You've had a week in the first chapter of James. We spent our first week getting to know the person James, and then this last week getting to know a little bit about the introduction. You've gone through 18 verses of the first chapter of James. So that means that you've hit on those wonderful and familiar words to many of you. Consider it pure joy when you fall into all sorts of trials because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And the translation that I've been memorizing out of actually uses the word perfect and let endurance have its perfect effect so that you may be perfect and complete, not lacking in anything. Now, that's out of the NET. Several of your versions also use the word perfect. And if you're like me, I'm pretty uncomfortable with that word. And I can hardly wrap my mind around the fact that somehow in this broken life, with my history behind me, that God can take me and do a complete work that somehow he's going to complete what he started in me. And I don't know if, if you're um, the kind of person like me that I can say it to someone else, but to believe it for me that he really is going to accomplish the thing, that if I'll cooperate with him, He's going to bring about not what would be in this lifetime a perfect person, but make no mistake, girlfriend, he can do a perfect work in an imperfect person. Anybody into that? I've been thinking about something because of something that happened uh, just here recently. I had the opportunity to be in California at a Living Proof Live event where we have Travis and the team and such a good time. And he and I always give each other a hard time. And and especially if something special is going on in one life, we usually try to make the other person bitter about it, just all in fun. And um, after that event, I had the opportunity to meet a group of five or six women that came from Caesar Milan's uh, particular um, office and his work. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the dog whisperer, but now Keith and I are because we are big dog freaks. And so this is his particular workplace and his staff, and like six of them came to the event. And so I got to meet them afterwards. I need to know if anybody knows who the dog whisperer is because it's really, really amazing, really amazing. And so I met with them afterwards. And so I was giving Travis a hard time. I said, excuse me, I get to go be with Cesar Milan's people. And so, and they gave me a t-shirt and it was really so much fun. And, and they gave me a book and the book was signed by Cesar Milan, the dog whisperer himself. <laughs> And I thought, Keith is going to fall in love with me all over again. I know that he's going to because it really, it doesn't get much better than this. And so I could not wait to get home. I said, you cannot believe what I have to show you. So I, I pull it out, uh, show him the book and turn in. I said, look, hugs and kisses in the inside, X, O's. And then he said, honey, that is just fun. That is fun. 
So I, I laid it out because I wanted it to be right there when I got up the next morning. It's kind of late coming in that night. And so the next morning, I was still uh, just tickled about it. I thought, I just want to go back downstairs, and I want to see if, it, if it's out there and if it still has his signature in the front of it, the dog whisperer. And so when I, when I went, I asked my sister here to, to hold this bag for me so that I could pull it out at this time. When I went to get the book, I found the book, but ironically... <laughs> It had been eaten up by my dog. <laughs> and oh, oh, the bitter irony of the name, How to Raise the Perfect Dog. <laughs> so I don't know if you feel that way, getting in to the book of James, where we're going to be made perfect and complete, not deficient in anything, and yet we're wrecks. Anybody? I'd like to know somebody else is a wreck besides me. Uh, we, uh, the way I see wholeness is I just bring all my pieces and all these parts together and heap them up in one big mess in front of the throne and go, this is wholeness. You can have the whole thing, the whole thing. And girlfriend, that is where it begins. I want you to see with me, here's what we're going to do, and I think we're going to have uh, a good time with it. I think we're going to go through some uh, tender moments to get to our good time, but I think you'll be game for this. We've been talking about joy in our Bible study this week and our homework. And what I want to do now, after we've looked at, at the um, exhortation to consider it all joy when we fall into all sorts of trials, I want you to look now at a teaching of Christ, the big half-brother, perfection himself, uh, the, the Word made flesh and dwelling among us. I want you to see one of his teachings on joy out of John chapter 16. So turn with me there if you would please. Anybody glad to be in the Word today? Oh, I love it. I love it. This is life to me. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. You know, it's everything I can do to keep from stopping right there and just going off on that because aren't you so glad Jesus will always tell you the truth? I don't know when the last time was you were lied to, but I can think of a time not very long ago that I was really outright lied to and it will leave an impression on you. I need you to know Jesus will always tell you the truth. Look at one another and say, Jesus will always tell you the truth. Jesus will always tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. You will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief. But I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. And in that day, you will no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. I love the thought of some complete joy. And our lesson is going to rest on some words, some contrasting words that we're going to see linked together that are right there in that section of verses 20 through 22. Now, at the top of your listening guide, you have an arrow leading to two extremes. And I want you to fill in those two words. You've got blanks to fill in on both sides. Over there in the left-hand margin, I want you to write down the word joy. That is our key word. But it's one of two key words that we're going to study in today's session. We've got joy on that side. Everybody say joy. joy. It is the Greek word kara, and it means all the things you think of when you think how you would picture joy, a glee, mirth, um, of, uh, a wonderful sense of contentment and ecstatic joy in him, that term kara. And then on the other side, in that other extreme, where that other arrow points, I want you to write down the word anguish. Anguish, philipsis, is the Greek word for anguish in this particular text. You and I are going to see how these words are strangely linked in the Word of God. And we're going to contrast them and we're going to compare them together because there's a wonderful working that God does in the Scriptures, particularly in the New Testament, through these two words. And this comes straight out of the teaching, out of the mouth of Christ himself. I want you to think, first of all, uh, camp with me on joy for a moment. 
because this particular kind of joy, kara, not only means joy, it means the reason for joy. It's connected into the definition that it's, it's joy, but it's joy with a reason. So I want you to think of times when you just kind of go, yeah, I'm, I'm just in a really great mood today. I don't even know why. I mean, have you ever done that? We're just really like, maybe a friend gets in the car with you and goes, you're in a really great mood. What's up with you? Well, I don't know. I just feel really good. That's a wonderful thing and we all need it. But that's not biblical joy because biblical joy is always attached to something. It always has a reason. I want you to think about the, the verse in Luke 10, 20, where it says, rejoice because your names are written in heaven. In other words, you can jump up and down about this because your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's something to jump up and down about. So it's not only joy, but it's attached joy. I felt like um, not long ago that the Lord gave me what I hope is just a little bit of insight into, in very human terms, way down here on planet Earth, and into what it might be like for Him when we rejoice in Him. What is it like for God? What is it like for our Savior Christ when we really do believe Him, take Him at His word, and in the midst of all sorts of tribulation, we determine we're going to have some joy? What is that like for Him? Now, we've gotten this far in the series, and I have not just gnawed you like a bone about my grandchildren, but now... Now, tis time. And I, like, I'm so drunk in love with them, I do not know what to do because they're part of my skin. And my grandson, uh, Jackson, is five, and my granddaughter and namesake, Annabeth, is two, just right at two and a half and right at five and a half. And I, I am just nuts over them. And I was thinking to myself, because Annabeth was the most recent one of the two born, I was thinking about the day that Amanda and Kurt uh, put a little t-shirt on Jackson that said, Big Brother. And that's how they told us that they were expecting another child. Well, I already began, even that day, to open up my heart to someone new to love because I knew this was going to be big. I knew it was going to be big. Didn't know what it was yet had no idea what the name would be, but I knew already, start to fall in love because the process has begun. Not long after that, they got the very first picture and with both of the grandbabies, I always carried around the sonogram picture. Everywhere I went and just wanted to go, here, this is my grandbaby. And they're, you know, it's not, it's not a blessing. It's not a blessing to anybody uh, but us, but it is a blessing to us. And, and so I, I, I loved the baby because I could see that picture. And then I'll never forget the day when uh, we found out that it's a girl. And in this family of women's ministry people, you cannot imagine the glee that broke out in our household over this little woman child. We've been so glad to get the man child, but we could not wait to get this woman child. But then it was after that that Amanda told us what her name would be. And there's just something about a name because suddenly this is not just a baby. This is a baby with a name and you begin to fall in love. And then there's the day that she's born and we get to see her, but we look straight in her eyes and she looks somewhere way <laughs> over there because for a matter of days and then for a matter really of weeks, it takes the infant some time to really focus on the mother, the daddy, the grandmother or the granddaddy's face. But then they hit about eight weeks old and you say something to them, and they break out in a smile, and it's too much. <laughs> it's too much. It's too much. These days, when Amanda puts her down out of the car, she can run up the sidewalk. I get down on my knees like this, and she cackles all the way to the door because she cannot wait to get to her grandparents. And I thought to myself, do you think it's possible that maybe biblical joy is when we smile back? I just wonder if maybe, maybe if it's when after all that he's done, and after the fact that he's loved us first, when we didn't even know he was alive, didn't even know he existed, but suddenly we know that he's God and we know that he's good, and joy smiles back. Maybe joy cackles out loud. Maybe joy runs down the sidewalk to get into what we believe to be his arms. Maybe that's just a taste of joy. Now, I want you to just, it, it's, it's meant 
to throw you almost into a whiplash as we turn to the word anguish, because I want you to feel the opposing terms and feel the emotions. I hope maybe in that story, you could feel a little outbreak of that joy. But now I want you to feel a little anguish. I want you to think of something that you would describe the last experience you had that caused you anguish. Think it through. And I, what I want you to see in your handout, because I think that this, uh, this uh, will be an important little piece to put together. Um, anguish can just be physical suffering. But more often than not, it is used to convey the added element of mental distress. Jot that down and see if it's so. Think it through. That anguish, as opposed to other words, say, for instance, as opposed to pain, that if you were to say, I am in anguish, I, I ask you, what would you mean by that? And, and wouldn't you often, if you were going to use that particular word, wouldn't you often be able to say, well, th there was a part of it that was mental distress. Anybody? There's a mental distress to it. For instance, just a couple of uh, ways to, to put it together here, a couple of equations. Think of it this way. Pain plus anxiety equals anguish. So you've got pain, yes. But by the time you add anxiety to the pain, then you've got you some anguish. Can anybody agree with that? Say, for instance, um, you have got the kind of migraine that is about to split your head in two. But say, for instance, you had already been through treatment for brain cancer four years ago. Girlfriend, you don't just have pain, do you? Because now you have some mental torment to go with it, and you've got yourself some anguish. Does that make sense? Look at the next equations. Okay, so suffering plus dread equals anguish. Does that make sense? So we're going through a time of suffering, yes, but then when we add the dread to it, that there's something, we are so dreading something that we believe may be inevitable, that then it turns in to anguish. Anguish equals hurt plus harassment. I wonder if any of you have ever been harassed by the evil one, that you just thought, you know what, I'm under oppression right now. Not possession, because I'm a possessed, by the Holy Spirit of the living God, and I'm sealed by him into the day of my redemption. But I am I'm being harassed right now. So, I mean, it's like there's not enough going on already. I've got this hurt, but now I've got this harassment with it, and the result is, tell me the word. The result is anguish. Now, anybody of any age, any type, we, we can all, and it's not an older person's thing. A 15-year-old could go through anguish over whether or not that relationship is going to work out. Whether or not people at the new school are even going to know she's alive, and if they do, if they're going to make fun of her. Um, a, a family secret or a family past and difficult history can cause anguish. A secret, a secret can cause a lot of anguish. Guilt can cause anguish. Regret can cause anguish. Anguish. I thought to myself, resisted conviction can certainly cause some anguish because you've got some mental torment going with it. In 1 Samuel, uh, the Word of God says that Hannah felt anguish over her infertility. So there are all sorts of things that can lead to anguish, but I wanted to tell you briefly what led me to the Word because something happened in particular that caused this Word to lock in my brain, and it happened to be when I was working through this part of the James study, and it's the reason why God led me to this material for today's session. Uh, my family and I, Amanda and Curtis, and our uh, two grandchildren, um, Jackson and Annabeth, uh, and an assistant of mine all boarded one of the smallest planes I've ever been on in my entire life so that we could go to a conference in uh, Asheville, North Carolina. Small planes going to small towns, it's just that kind of thing. And, and so um, when we got on the plane, I keep thinking back uh, at it because I felt something. But you know, you can't go jumping off a plane every time you feel something. I fly all the time. I also make things up all the time. I can make up, anybody besides me, I can make it up. I don't have to have any reality to base it on whatsoever. So if I just went with the feeling like I'd never get on, I'd never get in a car. And so I, I had the strangest feeling, but in we went, and I thought, you know what? It's because your babies are on here. That's what's got you kind of up in arms, is all the babies are on here. 
and your child, your son-in-law, these two babies, and this young woman that's with you, all get on the airplane. We get about 30 minutes into the flight when the pilot tells us that our hydraulics have gone out and we're turning back to Houston and going to make a landing. We've not gone out of Intercontinental, which is the big airport, but we were flying right back into it because they had the emergency equipment they were going to need for our landing. Picture the grandmother because I'm looking straight at the babies. I'm looking at their young mother who is my firstborn. I'm looking at my son-in-law. I'm looking at this young woman who assisted me and I cannot even tell you what went on in my mind. When we landed, they said that the, the, the hydraulics came on. They were both off, came on as we descended toward the airport. When we landed, there was all manner of ambulance, all manner of fire truck, you name it, it was out there waiting for us. And when we got off that plane, they were staring at us as people that uh, should be thinking how close they came to death. Let me tell you something. We had to get on another plane, head back out. Do you know that the whole time I was at that conference in Asheville, we had gone through all of that trauma and um, I never said a word about it. And you know why I didn't? I could not let it come out of my mouth. Do you know when I got back into that little airport, I literally went into the bathroom stall and went like this. <gasps> oh, oh, I, I almost could not even hold myself up. We, got, we went and did what we were called to do at the conference. We flew back home. The babies, all went, they went with their parents home. I went in my car home. I went through the front door of my home and I threw myself on that floor and I cried like there was no tomorrow. I cried until I felt like I was gonna break my ribs against the floor because I replayed that scene over and over again with a different ending. My babies were on that plane. My daughter was on that plane and it was gonna be ugly. Angst. The word kept going through my mind. This is anguish. It was mental torment. I wonder if anybody knows what I'm talking about because I tell that story to you to drum it up in you. When was the last time you felt angst? It's a very interesting word. I want you to see this in your listening guide. The etymology of the word, that's it's, it's very origins um, as, as the word itself, uh, the etymology of the word anguish, you see the Latin there, includes the meaning of to choke. But I want you to stare at it for a minute. Look at that word uh, in the Latin. You see it? Are you staring at it? The word in the Latin. What other word do you see there? Isn't that interesting? Did you know there is a very close connection between anguish and anger? And I don't know for sure what it is. I did a lot of looking, but it was not anything that I could really uh, uh, sink my teeth into and think that's got to be it. But here's what I wonder. If you think of that whole idea of choking, I, I wonder if maybe anguish chokes it down and maybe if anger chokes it up. In other words, something's got a stronghold on you. Anger keeps it all up here. Anguish keeps it all in here. Anybody going there with me? I, I want you to see also the Greek definition of philipsis, which is our word for anguish in our passage in John chapter 16. It's a word that means, and you're going to see the same kind of idea as the etymology I just talked about. It's a word that means to crush, press, compress, and squeeze. Compress and squeeze. So it's exactly the same kind of image here. It says, philipsis conveys the picture of something being crushed, pressed, or squeezed from a great weight. It is used to denote grievous physical affliction or mental and spiritual distress. And now, what are our two key words? Because I want you to remember them the whole time we're talking. Two key words, you said them from the very beginning, joy and anguish. And I want you to see, we're, we're seeing in Scripture how they're oddly linked together. I also want you to see the comparison of their intensity. Both joy and anguish are very intense feelings. They kind of fill you up. They kind of don't leave a lot of room for much more than that. Would you agree with that? So here, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go through uh, these connections in the Word of God between anguish and joy and see what we can come up with. Number one is this, anguish and joy can coexist. Now, how do we know that? Well, we know that primarily out of James chapter 1 that we just studied this very week in verse 2 when he says, count it all joy no matter what you're going through. 
So we, we know that from our major text. But I also want you to see a couple of other places because these really spoke to me. I turn with me to Romans 9, 1 through 5. Romans 9, 1 through 5. Now remember, our key word that we're looking for right now is going to be anguish, and we're going to compare it to how it can sometimes coexist with joy. Uh, the Apostle Paul says, I speak the truth in Christ, I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption as sons, theirs is the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. He's saying, listen, for my own people to come to know Christ, I have unceasing anguish. Here's what I want to point out to you. This is the same guy that said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And somehow he could know this intermingling of an unceasing anguish and an unceasing joy. Look at 2 Corinthians 7, 4 through 7. What was number one? Anguish and joy can do what? Can coexist. Could anybody just say from, from your own experience that that's true, that you've had an odd experience in your life when you were in anguish, but you also somehow had this strange sort of joy. Now, we've already talked about how intense they are and how they leave so little room for anything else, and yet these two things can creep up at the same time. Listen to the Apostle Paul's words again out of 2 Corinthians 7, and that is going to be 4 through 7. It says this, I have great confidence in you. I take great pride in you, and I am greatly encouraged. In all our troubles, my joy knows no bounds. Look at his troubles and his joy. For when we came to Macedonia, this body of ours had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn. Does that sound like something we talked about? Conflicts on the outside, fierce within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort that you had given him. In other words, Titus brought them comfort because he had been comforted by them. It's such a powerful, powerful statement and something that is talked about from the very beginning of 2 Corinthians. Here's what I want you to see. In all of this anguish, Paul still had this joy, both of them coexisting, both of them there at the exact same time. Something occurred to me, and I've tested it out in my thinking over and over, and I wondered, you do the same and see if it's so, and if it's not, then ditch it. But if it's worthy of some thought, think it through. I began to think that joy very often has an organic quality to it. In other words, joy, I don't think, um, as, as often comes to us in something as it does in someone. Now, first and foremost, of course, Christ Jesus himself, he is our joy. But notice that their comfort in their troubles and in their anguish was in Titus being sent of God to them. And I want to suggest to you that that's often true, that joy is tied more to relationships than it is tied to circumstances that somehow there's something about it. I love Psalm 4-7 that says this. It's talking about the psalmist to God. You have filled my heart with greater joy than when the grain and the wine increased. In other words, God, you are greater joy to me than any kind of circumstance could bring me. You are my joy. And you know what else I thought about? I thought how often anguish is the same way. I mean, tri tribulation brings us anguish. Um, warfare brings us anguish. But I bet when you were thinking about your example of anguish in your life, I, I, if I were a betting woman, I bet you it would have to do with someone else. Any chance of that? Any body ever brought you anguish? Because you see, there's that organic quality to both joy and anguish. I love Luke 15, 9 and 10. It's about the woman who loses the coin and she searches all over the place and she finds it and it says she calls her friends. Only in Greek, it, it, it uses these words, tas philos, uh, P-H-I-L-A-S, which is the feminine form of philos, uh, which is a friend. In other words, she called her girlfriends. And I just think there's something about women, we like to share joy, don't we? 
There's just something about joy that is meant to be shared. I want to read you something. Now, remember what our first point is, anguish and joy can coexist. I want you to hear some words out of a book called I Will Carry You. Listen to the subtitle of the book, The Sacred Dance of Grief and Joy. Isn't that perfectly what we're talking about in our present session? Uh, Angie Smith is a wonderful, wonderful young woman of God, a mother of a house full of little girls. And her husband uh, is Todd Smith. Uh, Many of you may be familiar with him because of the group Selah. Uh, he is the, the uh, male lead in that, um, in that group. And they learned from a sonogram uh, in the pregnancy for their fourth daughter that she, and I'm going to use the words that they used, uh, the doctors used, that she would be incompatible with life. And so there was the struggle with, of course, what do we do now? And they, instead of terminating the pregnancy, uh, placed themselves in the uh, hands of God and saw it all the way to the birth. And I want you to hear of a time that she describes in one portion of the book. The days after Audrey's diagnosis were some of the hardest. I would wake up in the morning and it would hit me over and over again that it was real. It seemed that every encounter with other people was so weighted down by the reality of my hurt that I could barely stand it. I avoided the never-ending phone calls asking Todd to take over because I simply could not talk about it anymore. Within a few days of the doctor's appointment, we spoke to our pastor, and he arranged a prayer meeting at our church. I'll never forget sitting in a circle with many of the deacons and several friends as they offered prayers to the Lord on our behalf. I remember that evening being one of peace. And as each person spoke, the conviction in my spirit grew stronger, and I felt more at ease than I imagined I could in such a situation. They read pertinent scriptures in hushed tones as if the Lord himself was sitting among us, and he was. That night I realized that while I'm an independent person who struggles with asking for help, this was a situation where I wasn't going to have that liberty. I sat fully humbled as many that I love spoke wisdom over me, and I admitted to myself that I was going to need help to get through the season of my life. Later that same week, my dear friend Julie had a baby shower for the little girl she was expecting, and I couldn't stand to miss it. Everyone there knew what was going on with me, and we all danced around it so that it wouldn't dampen the spirit of the party. Julie isn't the kind of person who operates well in the world of pretending. She is incredibly authentic and never shies away from whatever conversation will lead to the deep places. I know that night was as torturous as it was beautiful for her. As she opened her tiny pink onesies and bibs, surrounded by gifts, her eyes searched mine as we did our best to get through the night. At one point, we gathered around her and took turns praying over her sweet baby. As petitions for a healthy child and a smooth delivery filled the room, I felt my heart start to pound. Audrey was kicking me gently, persistently, and the tears started to fall. Audra and my friend Jessica held my hands, and before we knew it, there was a sniffling noise that filled the room. It was hard to tell if they were tears of joy or of sorrow. This is the line I want you to hear. I can distinctly remember the way grief and joy danced together as if. Grief and joy danced together as if they had a right to. It's the oddest thing. Joy and anguish can coexist. Number two is this. Anguish and joy can trade places. The first one told us that they can coexist. We see it in Scripture. But there's also a link between anguish and joy in that they can trade places. Isaiah 61, 1 and 3 are down uh, in your listening guide, and it says this, familiar words to a number of us, so dear to me, the Spirit of the Lord God is on me because the Lord has anointed me to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. So here we're talking about times when a swap takes place. There are times when God brings an unrelated joy into our distress to give us some relief and comfort. Would you agree with that? I I was thinking um, in my own life of a a very, very dark time in my family of origin. I was already uh, a young married woman at the time, 21 uh, years old, when, um, and listen, our family had always had all sorts of problems, but a bomb dropped on us. I mean, a bomb that sent shrapnel 
all over the family. And I, I, if, if I had the freedom to tell you, and it would not bless you, but you would know that this was just about as big a bomb as could hit in a family. And it, the repercussions of it were just ugly, ugly. But in the midst of all of this agony and all of this conflict and all of this uh, sudden reality, this ugly reality, I found out that I was expecting Amanda. Now, you do not know that I was supposed to need surgery to have children. My mother had exactly the same disorder that I have, and it took her nine years to conceive. My doctor told me, it will take you a surgery. Once you're ready, we're going to have to do a whole lot of getting ready uh, to make sure that you are able to have a child, but we think that you'll be able to do that uh, once we do all the things that we need to do procedurally. And so I suddenly end up expecting a baby two months after the day I married. Two months after the day I married. We were so shocked we did not know what to do. Only God was all wise. Because somehow in all of that agony, here came this pure, precious baby. And the whole entire extended family fell in love. And anguish was swapped for joy. Anybody ever had that happen? See, I want you to hear back in John 16, verse 20 again. Let's go back and look at these verses. I tell you the truth. You will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. Can you think of a time in your life where you were really going through anguish and then something really wonderful happens, totally unrelated, but something wonderful? Only what is being described here in verse 20 is your grief will turn to joy. And that brings us to number three in my very favorite part of this lesson. Number three is this. There are times when the source of anguish can morph into joy. The source of anguish can morph into joy. Write it down and I'll see if I can explain it to you. Everybody say it back to me. What is it? The source of anguish can morph into joy. Okay, remember we talked about that they can coexist, and then we talked about that they can swap places. One replaces the other. But what about times, like the scripture describes, when one actually turns into the other, because that's what this one's talking about. This is not a swap. This is a transformation. Uh, th th this, is, this is not a trade. This, this is a, a segue, a segue. One turns into the other. If we were thinking back on our verse in Isaiah 61, a three, where it says that, um, that God could give us beauty instead of ashes, because see, that's a trade-off. It would be instead that beauty had come out of the ashes. That's what it would mean in the context of point number three. It's when the same, stay with me here, the same roller coaster ride that gave you the nightmare of your life leads you into joy. That's what we're talking about now. And do you know that is biblical? Psalm 30, verse 11 says this. You turned my wailing into dancing, and you removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. You turned one into the other. Do you understand? This is not a trade-off. This is not coexistence. This is when one turns into the other. You turned my wailing into dancing. Watch the flip that's taking place here. You talk about a whiplash here. You took the very wailing that I had and you turned that wailing into dancing. That's what I want to talk to you about. I want you to see in your listing guide, I have the uh, lexical form of the Hebrew word hapach. It is the word that means to turn to turn, and it means to turn, it means to convert or change. You'll also see in the definition that it says it's frequently used in connection with the acts of God. I want you to hear something because I want this to all come into play in your thinking, make space in your brain for this kind of transformation. This word, hapak, is used in all of the following times I'm, I'm going to uh, read out to you. When it's, when, you remember when God um, turned the Nile into blood? It wasn't traded. The Nile, the waters of the Nile, the brown waters of the Nile, which I've seen with my own eyes, were turned into blood. Same waters went from mud to blood. You got it? Then there's also the time when he turned the rod of Moses into a serpent. 
So that, that doesn't mean that he had, um, he had a rod and then he also got a serpent. He took the same rod and he turned it into a serpent. He turned the sea into dry land, exactly the same word, to dancing. That's what I want to talk to you about. I want you to see in your listing guide, I have the um, lexical form of the Hebrew word hapach. It is the word that means to turn, to turn. And it means to turn, it means to convert or change. You'll also see in the definition that it says it's frequently used in connection with the acts of God. I want you to hear something because I want this to all come into play in your thinking. Make space in your brain for this kind of transformation. This word, hapak, is used in all of the following times I'm, I'm going to uh, read out to you. When it's, when, you remember when God um, turned the Nile into blood? It wasn't traded. The Nile, the waters of the Nile, the brown waters of the Nile, which I've seen with my own eyes, were turned into blood. Same waters went from mud to blood. You got it? Then there's also the time when he turned the rod of Moses into a serpent. So that, that doesn't mean that he had, um, he had a rod and then he also got a serpent. He took the same rod and he turned it into a serpent. He turned the sea into dry land, exactly the same word. I love especially Deuteronomy 23 verse 5 because it says, I just have to take the time uh, to read it to you because it's talking about the time when uh, the uh, enemies of the Israelites tried to get uh, someone to curse them. And it says, however, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam, but turned the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loves you. I don't want you to think in terms, I'm not talking about um, real live doctrinal curses here. I'm just talking about when you've gone through something really, really rough. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Imagine that he takes that very thing and he turns that into the blessing, the very thing that was your horror becomes something so dear to your heart that you would not know what to do without it. When the same roller coaster ride that brought you through your nightmare brings you to your dreams. As I look across this room and I'm wondering what's on the other side of that screen, I would imagine some of you look very much like they do all sorts of ages. But here's what occurs to me is there are many of us in this room that have um, gray hair, some of which uh, you would not know that we have gray hair. Um, only God does. But trust some of us, we do, we do. But we would want to say this over many of you young ones. We would want to tell you that it is uncanny how often God will take your pain and turn it into your passion. How many of you really have a passion for something that you just, you pour your lifeblood into? I have a passion for young women uh, who come out of backgrounds of abuse and have just, just sold themselves, um, and maybe not literally, but just given themselves away um, as if they are of no value. I have, a, I have a passion for that because of my pain of a background of sexual abuse. He turned my nightmare into a blessing because that pain became part of my life passion. I'll tell you something, girlfriend. I've said this over and over again. I'll say it to the grave. You can live with pain a whole lot better than you can live with purposelessness. All of us need purpose. We need passion. We were born for it. And so often it's that thing that we hated at one time that God turns around and uses to bless us. I love Philippians 1, 18 and 19, and it says, Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Holy Spirit of Christ Jesus, that what has happened to me, listen carefully, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Stay with me here. It doesn't say that this has happened to me and then I'm going to get this deliverance. No. A transformate, one is being turned into the other. What happened to me has turned into my deliverance. Listen to me, sisters. The worst nightmare of my young adult life is the very thing that God used to set me free. It was the very thing that made me face that I was going to implode. I, I was going to completely self-destruct. 
something. So I had to see such an ugly side of myself and realize what I was capable of doing to God's image created in me. It was so earth shattering and so ugly that it was that very thing God used for my deliverance. You take that away from my life, I got no deliverance. It can turn your anguish into joy. Number four is this. Mental anguish can be like the mind in labor. Anybody know about anguish? Anybody know about some joy? Anybody know how God can turn one into the other in such a stunning way that you find your life purpose right smack in the middle of it? Only a redeemer. Ladies can do that. Only a redeemer. Mental anguish can be like the mind in labor. Watch this. Psalm 55, verses 1 through 5. Our key word is going to be in verse 4, so I'm giving you a heads up. Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me, and I am distraught at the voice of the enemy and at the stares of the wicked, for they bring down suffering upon me and revile me in their anger. My heart is in, what does it say? My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death assail me. Fear and trembling have beset me, and horror has overwhelmed me. I looked up that word in verse 4. What was the word again? Anguish. And so now I'm going to give you the Hebrew definition, because we were talking a little while ago out of the New Testament. Uh, for those of you who are new to Bible study, uh, our original language in the New Testament is Greek, in the Old Testament Hebrew, uh, and a little bit of Aramaic. And so here we've got a Hebrew word, and, and I think you're going to really get this one. Listen to this definition of this Hebrew word that is, tra that is translated into our English, anguish, in Psalm 55, verse 4. To turn in a circle, I can just feel it, to twist, revolve, to writhe, to prevail in childbirth. Anybody just like feeling like you're going into transition right now? <laughs> to bear a child. The main idea is writhing in pain, which is particularly associated with childbirth. There's your blank. With childbirth. Suffering torment, experiencing anguish or distress. So, okay, let me see if I can, if I can uh, reason this out with you. So, the word in um, Psalm 55, verse 4, obviously does not mean that David himself is in labor. Um, we have seen that the wisdom of the Lord, that he chose women for labor. We know that from when our men, like, get a cold. Amen? So, <laughs> we... Was, men do not go through this kind of labor, and it is God's good purpose and his good will. Now, we know David's not going through a physical labor, but he is saying, my mind is in anguish. It's travailing. It is writhing. When was the last time you had that kind of mental anguish? It's like the mind in labor. Now, listen, I, I'm a big one for finding scripture. You can pray over your life and pray over your loved one's life. To me, listen, I, we're wide open for what we can pray uh, in the will of God. We've got a Bible full. But I love when I can find a scripture. I feel like this is me coming back before the throne going, your word says right here. I already feel like it's sanctioned somehow. That I mean, you got it right here in your scriptures, and I'm going to pray this back. And for some of you, I want you to hear 16 through 18 of that same psalm, Psalm 55, 16 through 18, because somebody needs this to take home with them uh, today. It says, but I call to God, and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice, and he ransoms me unharmed from the battle waged against me, even though many oppose me. I don't know what you're going through right now, but I know that he can bring you out on the other side without you being so bloody and wounded and scarred that you cannot get up and go on with your life. That I do know, sister. That I do. No matter how it swirls around you, no matter what is happening to you, I know for a fact, and if I were you, take these verses, start praying them, say, God, I am asking you, maybe for your family, maybe for your child, ransom us unharmed from this battle that is waged against us. And he will hear that prayer. He hears our earnest prayers. What was number four? Mental anguish can be like what? The mind in labor. And there's a really good reason why we went there for number four so it could lead us to number five. Turn back with me where we'll end in John 16, 20 through 22. 
I've often told the story of my mom. Um, she was such a handful. I, I guess you probably can imagine that. Um, I really ended up doing something altogether different than she might have uh, wanted. My, her her uh, father and, and my grandfather was a lawyer, and that's what I really went to school to be. I really wanted to go into politics just like he did. And uh, the Lord called me out. And so the hard part of it for my parents is that I was on a vocational track uh, knowing very much what I wanted to do. And, and when, I, um, when I surrendered uh, to the call of God, it was years and years and years before there was the least hint of what it even might remotely be. You understand? Or can you step in that with me? So uh, it was, it was uh, uh, really hard for them um, in some respects. They're proud of it, yes, but they were not just Bible freaks. Church freaks, yes, but not really necessarily Bible freaks. And so she would come when I just started going like, like nuts. I mean, they didn't know even what to do with me, but she would come to my class. And when I'd have my class turn back and forth like that, she'd finally just, she'd slap her hands down on the Bible. like slap her hands, We're going to sit right here and you're going to teach right out of this passage. <laughs> right in front of my class. I mean, she would call me and go, what time is Bible study this week? And I would want to lie. And go, you know what? We canceled. We canceled. She was just, it's hard to take authority over your mother. So it says in verses 20 through 22, John 16, I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. And then here is this metaphor again. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. I I don't think pain quite, you know, if it were, I'm just saying, if it were a woman that had been inspired right here to write the word, it might've been stronger than pain. Um, (laughs) to a child um, has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish. What does she do? She forgets what? She forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. And so with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. I want you to see number five together with me. Anguish is meant to lead to a birth. This is everything we've been working up to for the last solid hour in this session. Anguish, biblically speaking, Old Testament and New Testament. There's something about anguish that is uh, wound up in the whole writhing and travail of childbirth. The metaphor is used in the Old Testament. It's used in the New Testament. That's when we want to get a clue that he's trying to tell us something. And overwhelmingly, when that metaphor is used, anguish was meant to bring about a birth. It's meant to birth something. Now, I'm going to tell you what can happen to us. We can get into a situation that is so difficult and causes such mental anguish and so much travail that uh, we hardly know what to do. And what we can do then is we can just cease trusting God, completely shut down, turn our backs on Him, and decide to go our own way. And all of that will be exactly what God said over the Israelites in Isaiah chapter 26 when He said, you travailed and you were in labor and then you gave birth to the wind because they rebelled and would not look to Him. I give you this promise, not as my promise to you, but a promise of the Word of God. This is Scripture talking to you. If you will trust God with your anguish, it will birth something precious to you. It will birth something to you that you would not trade back and and trade out that experience of anguish for anything in this world. Something precious is meant to come out of this. Will we stomp our feet, throw our backs a back in rebellion, get our necks stiffened and disobey and never see what was meant to come out of the anguish? Or will we trust him? Will we trust him? You did not know that you were in labor. All this is labor. You're thinking, well, but you know, it really hurts. Oh, well, no kidding. I mean, at the end of, I was giving birth in that time period when people believed that if you took even the least pain reliever during your labor, this is what was true 30 years ago, that you would have destined your child to an addiction to cocaine or heroin. Does anybody my age remember this? 
It was the natural childbirth was the thing in those days. And I'm telling you, I was going to do the right thing for my child. So I certainly wasn't going to take anything. And I went in just with that mentality. And I'm telling you, I got to about six centimeters. <laughs> by the time it was over, I felt like I had been mauled by a bear. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I, I could not believe, I mean, like they were all gawking over at the baby. I was thinking to myself, someone should come and put like a wreath of roses around my neck, <laughs> like they do with horses. I mean, that is only fair. I have never, I was 22 years old. I was not cut out for that. And it just was, it was the most shocking thing. I cannot tell, nothing, nothing could have shocked me as badly as childbirth. I mean, when I went in for my second birth, I wore a t-shirt that said, say yes to drugs. Am I not? <laughs> yes. Yes. I could not wait. So, yes, I can identify with, but this really hurts. But maybe at the peak of the pain, that baby's just about to come out. Are you going to give up? just before the baby is due. Because all that anguish, he would have delivered you. Do you not think he loves you more than that? If you, his child, if you've been asking him over and over, Lord, deliver me, deliver me, and you're still in your anguish, it's because something is going to be born. Something precious. Passion from your past. You cannot buy that anywhere. It is a gift from God. What was number five? Are you going to believe him for that birth? Let's pray together. Oh, Father, you thrill me. You do. You give us hope, Lord throat is so thick with emotion. I, I don't understand the holiness and the righteousness and rightness of a God who honestly is able to turn our wailing into some of the greatest sources of joy that we'll ever have. Give us patience through the anguish because we want to obey you here because we, we're understanding from your word that if we don't, if we don't see it through with you, then all this pain ends up for nothing. So give us that tenacity. Father, I ask for a big word. Give us trust. We say to you, Lord, we have not trusted you with this yet. I don't speak those words over anybody that they don't belong to, but for some of us, we have thrown our heads back in rebellion and our travail and have refused to trust you. And it's time to put it back in your hands. Do what only you can do. Convert our way into wild dancing. In Jesus' name, amen.